So today, I'm standing in the ghost town of Drexel University um, at the base of good old Pearlstein over here. I'm actually standing four floors below my very own office in which I'm prohibited from entering. You'll already hear some uh, jets in the background. So over there, we're starting our walk while we're getting a flyover of, I think it's the Blue Angels and maybe some others in, in commemoration of, um, or in recognition of people that are uh, helping in, in, in medical situations um, fight the pandemic. And, uh, and it makes for a fitting start to a, to a walk that I wanna take you from University City at our campus into Center City. The topics I want us to kind of wrestle with are um, what is this thing called design thinking and really what's, what's design all about? Entrepreneurs by their nature are designers and design does not have to be formal. Thinking can lead to all kinds of design and then solutions that come from design. And a main point of this walk is going to be that come to think, if you think about it, there's not a single place where you can walk where where you're walking isn't a direct result of somebody else's design thinking. There isn't a product that you use that isn't the result of somebody else's design thinking. So we may or may not realize it, but our whole lives are shaped by the design of others. And so one way to kind of learn about it is to kind of see past designs, break them apart a little bit, and then ask yourself, by the way, this is the city, so we'll, uh, we'll let the uh, police pass as well. So when we're walking the streets of Philadelphia, we should be constantly asking ourselves, what were they thinking here? Why is that building over there? Why does that street look the way it does? You know, why is that signpost where it is? It's all design, it's all design. So Philadelphia did not used to look like the Philadelphia of today. So the, arguably the first designer of Philadelphia was William Penn, along with his engineer, surveyor, Thomas Holm. And so when William Penn founded the city of Philadelphia, which was founded um, towards where we're gonna walk east of here along the Delaware River, he realized that, that the new city would be situated between the Delaware River and the Schuylkill River. And so he made a monumental decision in the, like this late 1600s that let's create a city and let's be, let's be very planned and geometric about it. So Philadelphia was laid out on a grid pattern. And some people look back at that, they think it's ingenious. Others maybe don't think about it much, but it was a huge decision because do you think Philadelphia is flat? A lot of you might answer that with, a, with an affirmative, yes. And Philadelphia feels generally flat, but Philadelphia in its natural state was not so flat. This, where we're standing right now, as the eastern end of what's called the Piedmont. Piedmont is French for foothills. And so we're technically in the early foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. So I'm on Market Street. And um, if I point to the east and I followed Market Street east, I, I would have been, and end up coming not just to the Schuylkill River and the Delaware River, I'd, all, I'd make it all the way to the ocean that way in, in, in about 50, 60 miles. But if I go west on Market Street and then I keep walking, 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 I would find my, myself in the Pocono Mountains, which are part of the Appalachians. So Philadelphia was hilly. It was loaded with creeks and streams, and it was definitely a rolling hill environment. But when somebody decides that we want the streets all to line up in perpendicular fashion, like a crisscross, and, and wants to make that happen, then it's really hard to do that and keep all your little like 
hills and valleys and things like that. So think about it, 16, 1700s, there weren't cars, there weren't trains yet. So what was transportation other than foot? It was horse and horse and buggy. And so if you're gonna have a street, you want your street to be pretty, pretty flat. Otherwise you got your horse and stuff going, doing this all the time. So once William Penn made the decision that Philadelphia was gonna be on a grid, it led to like a major, major overhaul of the land over time that is between the rivers to line the streets up. So in order to get from Front Street, which is First Street in Philadelphia, up to where we are, 32nd Street, you have, you have your numbered streets going north-south, and then you have other streets that originally mostly were named after trees, like Walnut Street and Pine Street. Market Street is an exception, and it used to be called High Street. But you have these streets lining up in a crisscross fashion, so what had to be done over time was what's called cutting and filling. So when Penn decided that we are gonna have a city that, that lines up logically you know, on, with, uh, with, with perpendicular streets, there needed to be all these projects where the hills needed to be flattened and the valleys needed to be filled, so you more or less got a flat walking surface or horse riding surface. And so right off the bat, um, William Penn kind of set in motion how Philadelphia planning would go that goes right up to this very day. So there's been a lot of changes over time. In fact, where we're standing right now where Drexel is, there was a big Pennsylvania Railroad Depot right at 32nd and Market. In a few minutes, we're gonna be at the 30th Street Station, the big train station built by the Pennsylvania Railroad. But everything in Philadelphia lies along the grid. So with that thinking in mind, we're gonna be keep asking ourselves again, what was in the designer's mind when these things were done? So let's take a, let's start to take a walk and, um, and, and see what we see as we head east into Center City. So we're gonna walk our way east along Market Street. It's a beautiful late April day. The only thing missing are the people. So did you ever stop and think about how you feel when you're on campus? Do you like its design? building across the street used to be a Firestone building. Do you like how our, our um, university is using that space right now? Is that the best use of that space given where it is? Could there be a different use for it? Could there be one that, that encourages students to get there more? That's, these are design questions. Is that the best use of that building? Do you like our campus? Remember, how you feel when you walk this campus, it's a product of, of somebody's design thinking. Somebody decided that they wanted to put these trees here. That pink thing is a pink flowering dogwood. A straight species dogwood would have white flowers, so Supposedly a designer said, I want pink here for the effect. I don't want white. It's a clear design decision. You know, does that work for you? Does our university work as an urban campus for you? In some publication several years ago, Drexel was voted the ugliest campus, ugliest urban campus in the country. Do you agree with that? Are you offended by that? Well, what do you think could make our campus better, livelier? Again, these are all design questions. A 
big design question that's that's taking where like the thought around it is taking place as we speak is the site of what's called Schuylkill Yards. That flat building across the, the street with the address of 3101. It's part of the old Philadelphia Bulletin Complex, which we're coming to, which is now Drexel Plaza. That's all part of the initial uh, phase of 14 acres known as Schuylkill Yards. So in the direction I'm looking at right now, if the plan goes as it's planned, there, there will be large skyscrapers, high tech looking things, filling up the, uh, the void in the sky that's over there. Those decisions are big decisions. They're big planning and design decisions. Might there be a better use of the space under this structure? which carries a freight train. Very infrequently, by the way. Might you put a pop-up facility there? You could sell things there. You could, you could grow shade-loving plants under there. Is that the was that the best use of that under the structure area? So in coming to the signpost, for Lincoln Plaza or 3020 Market, you can see two of the three partners um, for the uh, Schuylkill Yards. There's our very own Drexel and Brandywine Realty Trust. It's a good time to look into what's being planned for that. It's a huge undertaking. It'll take years to happen. And, but once you, once you make a, once you put a building somewhere, it's an expensive decision. So you hope that your decision is the right one. Once you put a street somewhere, same thing. It's not like you can't move a street. Any, you can do anything with money, but it, but it can cost millions, if not billions of dollars sometimes when you need to uproot infrastructure. So all of that stuff goes into design thinking. So look at this, jaywalking Market Street pretty easily on a Tuesday afternoon. When is that normally possible? So here's a really pricey redesign decision. Okay, so this is a, a, a modernly historic building, meaning a, a building that was built in a, in a modernist architectural style, and it housed the, uh, the offices and the printing presses of the Philadelphia Bulletin which unfortunately went out of business, geez, maybe around 1980 or so. And uh, it was the competing newspaper with the Philadelphia Inquirer. And it's the first phase of, of Schuylkill Yards. And one of the early things that the uh, owners of this project wanted to do was make an impression and turn a parking lot that was right here where we're standing into an area for gathering. They put a lot of money into this, uh, into this park over here. You can see some pretty big trees on, on the outskirts. They're called Dawn Redwoods. Each one of those trees costs a lot of money. To, to, to put a tree in of that size, that's quite an undertaking. So again, this was all a conscious design decision. And then, and then you, put a, you put this area here and then, and then, uh, and then you hope that it works. And this is an example of something that was put down maybe a year ago. And one of the questions you might have is like, who gathers here? Who would gather here on a busy day? Um, those stripes through the grass, are they, like could two people walk them like arm in arm or side by side? Um, who were they made for? You know, what, what's the design intent of this plot here, okay? Is it for you to sit down and have a picnic? 
Um, it's, it's purposefully curved so you can see that it's not, it's not flat. So, you know, like, is there a reason for that? Is it for water drainage? Is it for aesthetics? Is it for both? But, but you know, what, what is the design intent? When this, since this has been built, and, that, and, and we're talking before the pandemic situation, I've hardly ever seen much gathering take place over here. And yet across the street, you have a hugely busy train station, 30th Street Station, so is that a product of this being new? Is it a product of it being a poor design? You know, what's going on there? Does this make you want to grab a beach towel and sit down and hang out and do homework or anything? If you just guessed that I was gonna run across the street there, you were right, always trying to push it. But I decided the better of it. My department got me this GoPro. It wouldn't be a good thing if I, uh, you know, if I got hit by a car and then broke the GoPro. So what is the train station? This gargantuan place. What's that all about during a pandemic? Here's a mini design decision. How come this door is closed? Why does it look all closed up over here? What's that designed for? Oh, excuse us. No problem. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Have a good day. You too. So take this in as we walk through here. You can see a clock. 2.25 on a Tuesday or 224 to be exact. It was a design decision straight ahead to replace this cool old 1970s ticking schedule sign and put this LED one here. To me, it doesn't have the same, excuse me while I'm, we're being told to social distance. But if you look up what the old uh, sign looked like at 30th Street Station, you might decide, ah, oh, that was too old and it wasn't, it, you know, it, it was dated. This, this is LED, doesn't quite have the same character to me. When have you seen a large train station like this so utterly empty? So I'm looking straight ahead down JFK Boulevard. It was first called Pennsylvania Boulevard when it was built. It's one of the newer streets in Philadelphia. That's gonna be a good part of the backbone of our walk.
But first we're gonna take a little roundabout way to get there. There's a new sign. Do you like the design of that? Take a look at this beautiful eagle up ahead. So that eagle tells the story of an interesting set of desi design decisions that were really, really huge that date back to the uh, early 1960s. But it, we just came through 30th Street Station. When it was first built, it was just, it was simply called Penn or Pennsylvania Station because it was built by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was one of the largest corporations in the entire country at the time. And so the Pennsylvania Railroad built stations in, in a variety of cities. And so there was a Penn Station in New York that was even more majestic than the one we just walked through. It was modeled after Roman baths. It had huge skylights. It had a lot of ironwork in it. And it was this, it was this favored building by New Yorkers. And what ended up happening was railroads are huge owners of real estate. And by, by their virtue, by the virtue of being a railroad, you're automatically in effect a, uh, a, a real estate owner and you can conceivably be a real estate developer. And so what happened was Railroads started to falter after uh, World War II. The uh, Pennsylvania Railroad saw an opportunity with something called air rights. And a decision was made to take a train station along the same size of what I'm looking at right now, our own 30th Street station, knock it down, in its place build what is now called Madison Square Garden. Don't totally get rid of something called Penn Station, but put it underground and next thing you know, you got this expensive place for the Knicks and the Rangers to play their games. So that was done. And in the early 1960s, Penn Station in New York was knocked down. And almost as soon as the wrecking ball hit it, there was a major dismay expressed by New Yorkers. What did we do? We just knocked down one of the most beautiful structures in the entire world. And so, what happened was some things got salvaged, including this eagle. This eagle is just one example of the, of the artwork that adorned the uh, old Pennsylvania station. So we're walking across the river now on Market Street and there are eagles at the four different corners of this bridge. Meanwhile, the, the Pennsylvania Railroad buried most of the rubble in the New Jersey Meadowlands is, is one big depository of old Penn Station. Sometimes sad stories have some silver linings. The silver lining of that story is that the, the architectural preservation movement really came into high gear due to people's regret and sadness at what they had done. So we still lose buildings on a regular basis that we later on regret. But since the demise of, um, of Old Penn Station in New York, there's definitely been more of a focus to try to value the old, preserve it, and, and make design decisions that, that enable the preservation of that design, yet still have it meet the, the demands of the current day.
So as part of our roundabout detour to go find ourselves back at JFK Boulevard, I wanted to show you a little piece of the Schuylkill River and also talk about design thinking. As we're walking down, here's a pop quiz. Where does that river go to? Do you know? By the way, can you tell um, on your honor, which way is it flowing? Is it flowing to the left or to the right? Can you tell? Well, here's the answers. Time to see how, you, how well you did. Schuylkill River is flowing really to the left, okay? Doesn't look like that, and we can explain why in a second right now. It flows for another, uh, I don't know, six or seven miles maybe, makes its way to the Delaware River. The Delaware River makes its way to the Delaware Bay. Delaware Bay blends in with the Atlantic Ocean. So the Schuylkill River is considered at this point very much a tidal river. And that means that two times a day, the Schuylkill River in the exact area where we're walking right now goes up seven feet and down seven feet. Again, two times a day that happens. So what have you heard about sea level and what it's doing these days? And you've probably all heard that sea level is noticeably rising over time. Well, a design decision and planning decisions were made over 100 years ago that you could put buildings right up to the side of the Schuylkill River. Not only that, a decision was made as late as the 1950s to put an interstate highway, I-76, the Schuylkill Expressway, that we're looking at across the river, literally right next to the river. If you look down, you can see what is called an unnatural bank of the river. Same with the other side. So basically the river was turned into a canal. Railroad tracks and buildings were built up almost to its side. And now we have sea level rise. So what do you think that means for a city like Philadelphia? Well, right now where I'm standing, it looks all calm. But this exact area already floods very often. Several times a year, the river, for different reasons, overflows its banks, and, uh, and this whole area gets dusty because there's a lot of silt in the river, and when it resettles, um, all that silt stays here, and then city workers have to come out and clean it up. But what is Philadelphia gonna do as sea level follows what's predicted, which is that it's gonna rise considerably over the next several decades. In fact, this very same spot by the year 2100, we might be looking at a river that's at least five times on average higher, five feet higher, not times, but five feet higher than, than it is right now. So what do you think that's gonna mean for the uh, Schuylkill Expressway? How are you gonna get cars there when there's gonna be water there? What do you think happens when there's a hurricane that coincides with a high tide? Well, that's what happened in Katrina, and New Orleans got nearly wiped out when that, when, when that happened. What happens if you add in like a full moon or a new moon, which has a gravitational pull and sort of exacerbates tides? So all of these are questions that a long-term planner slash designer needs to be thinking. You know, right now the big question is, what would you do here? So when I was uh, on a tour led by a project manager at the Philadelphia airport, the Philadelphia, he, I asked him, why is the Philadelphia airport undergoing a project to expand and put runways, literally a new runway, on the Delaware River? The Delaware River is basically at sea level, and that means that when you get a flood, that the, the airport is one of the first places that gets inundated by that flood. And so when, if you build an airport at sea level and sea level's rising, it's almost a near certainty that that's gonna be an issue in the not too distant future. But when I raised that question about, hey, how are you guys contingency planning around that? You know what the project manager said? 
he said, oh, I don't need to worry about that. I'm gonna be retired by then. So there was not much of a concern um, by him. And that's sometimes the planning problems that we have or that, that we don't necessarily take into account um, the future. We're just thinking about today. So check that wall, that little piece of wall across the way, put it in your short-term memory, and then we're gonna come back to a, a continuation of it in a second as we walk down the Schuylkill Trail. The Schuylkill Trail that we're wa walking on is another, what I would call successful example of design thinking. There was a landscape architect named John Collins, and believe it or not, he first conceived of having a trail that was accessible to humans, along the river way back in the 1960s and, then I have and it and it took the city about 40 years until it finally built this trail that we're walking on access to rivers in big cities like philadelphia unfortunately is a rarity you know mo most riverfront areas are taken up by businesses by condos but uh and 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 they don't have the, the the planning did not allow for the public to be there most to this very day most of the delaware river and schuylkill river you do not have free access to so something as simple as this walkway was it was a uh you know it took 40 years to to come into being so again check out that wall structure over here we're gonna talk about that, and that's gonna help unify the next section of our walk. You can see the various vines growing from it. One of those vines looks like it's Virginia creeper. Another vine is poison ivy. Poison ivy can look beautiful from a distance. So, what we're looking at right now is the remnant of something that was built by the Pennsylvania Railroad in the late 1800s, and it served up through the first half of the 20th century. And it was, I think, officially known as the Filbert Street Viaduct, but it's more affectionately called the Chinese Wall. And so when the, Phil when the Pennsylvania Railroad was still expanding and, and demand for railroad um, use was was in its heyday there there was the need to build a structure that could i believe hold eight lanes of of trains so eight eight side by side rails rode this this platform that we're looking at and basically from the schuylkill river down to broad street to at that time what was called broad street station this big beautiful old victorian designed um, train station, which had, I believe, also the largest train shed in the world when it was built. And um, so you had like busy train traffic um, high atop the, 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 uh, the, grade, the remaining grade of the city. So the Chinese wall, while it, it, it led to a lot of um, commerce and, and, uh, and train use, it also was a huge divider for, for Center City, because you just saw how long it took us to go from you know one piece of the wall to the other, but it basically ran between Market Street and Filbert Street, a whole city block wide. And in order to get from you know Market over to say like Arch Street, you had to go through these arch tunnels that you know could get pretty skeevy if they weren't kept up. Plus, they were a good place for a crime to take place. So the Chinese Wall was a definite divider. So this is just the remnant. Above me now is, is a bridge that, uh, that takes trains across the river now. And that connects to a tunnel and it doesn't impede traffic that much once it, uh, once it goes down in the tunnel. So let's make our way up to JFK Boulevard and see what that's all about and how it relates to that old Chinese wall structure.
again, as we prepare for our flight up the steps, connection is all about planning thinking and design thinking. And then handicapped access. So we're, whereas we just walk down a ramp or up a ramp, no, I'm sorry, down a ramp to get to a, the river on Market Street, anybody could access that, whether they're on foot or on a, in a wheelchair. But over at JFK Boulevard, there's no elevator here, so this is not handicapped accessible. And the only way to get from the river level up to the street level is through steps. Ramps cost a lot of money. They take up a lot of area. So whenever you're thinking about connections, you know, when, when you decide about using a ramp or not, that's a big design decision. So here we are on old Pennsylvania Boulevard, now called JFK Boulevard. So this is all reclaimed real estate. Do you ever hear of Park Avenue? In New York City, Park Avenue used to be the same as the Chinese wall. It used to be a, a raised platform, very wide. It carried loads and loads of trains to Grand Central Station, a beautiful station that luckily has not been knocked down. By the way, let's get uh, another bird's eye view of a little piece of what's left of the Chinese wall. So Park Avenue was the real estate development design idea of, of the railroad called New York Central. And um, the New York Central Railroad also realized the value of having air rights above its tracks. And so they, had the they made the decision to sink their trains underground, have them still continue their pathway to, um, to Grand Central, and then make that space available for real estate development. That, and if you've ever been to Park Avenue, which is a green boulevard in the midst of the city, it's been a success almost from day one. So, it, so that's an example where land was, re, was actually reclaimed and, it, and, it, and it, had a, it had a real benefit, a real noticeable you know, impact positively on, um, on the city of New York. So here, the Chinese wall is basically what's left of it is used to support an abutment of this, of this newer bridge that holds JFK Boulevard. So that also is a design decision to, to reuse a piece of the old structure. Now again, the rest of it was, was basically carted off to landfills or, or dumped somewhere. Back then, they would, dump, they would dump building remains just about anywhere they could and uh, you know, without thinking much about impact to the environment. So what do you think of this stretch of JFK Boulevard over here? Let me tell you, if there was no pandemic, it would still be just as empty feeling as it is right now. Other than being a great place to go drag racing, there's like, you never see any people up here. This is one side of the Philadelphia Electric Company. You know, now it's just called Pico owned by Exelon. But this isn't, a, this isn't an entryway for the people that work here. So in what could be a different set of circumstances with new thriving activity has basically since the day that this was created, it's been like a dead zone. So let's take a little sneak over this fence thing here. I'm not big on fences. They didn't used to have this fence here, so now they're making this kind of do a mini little trespass. But it's a structure tour, so you need to get you need to get a, uh, a sense of some things. So I'm this grass is is on top of the old Chinese wall. 
Let's go look down from the old Chinese wall. Don't worry, I won't jump. See the beautiful vines growing on it? So we're on a historic structure. This rusted piece of remnant with English ivy on it and some graffiti. If you can picture over the over the um, over to the right, that actually held what's called a catenary structure. It held a structure that supported wires once the trains had the ability to run on electricity rather than coal or steam. So they didn't, for some reason, they didn't take that out and it's still there. Now I hope they keep it there always because it's, it's, a, it's a past, it's a, an example of our industrial and railroad past. So this is a good vantage point to see. We're standing on a piece of the old Chinese wall and then we have, you know, literally, like I could, you know, we could almost jump it. By the way, here's, this is a good view if you can see of stalactites growing like down there those pointy things that's limestone that's no different from what you would get in a cave and what you have is acid rain working on the limestone that is a main component of of concrete which is used in, in the building of the, uh, the 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 bridge structure across the way so you can see the wires the commuter trains for Philadelphia use this on a regular basis and around 20th Street, they go underground and then they stay that way. So that's what you have going on that's still active. And, uh, and then we have JFK Boulevard over where the Chinese wall used to be. So Philadelphia, over the last couple decades, has really come alive, it's filled in. Center City doesn't have that many dead areas anymore. But arguably the last place to fill in in Center City is right where we're standing here. So this, if, so we're looking over towards Market Street. And when you see a surface parking lot, that's basically the sign of someone who owns this waiting, okay? So that's speculation. They might make a few bucks um, to, to park the cars, but uh, that's not an effective use of space um, considering what real estate values are in Center City, Philadelphia. So while most of Center City has filled in with skyscrapers and other expensive buildings, this area finally is starting to head in that direction. But one of the reasons why this is the last place basically in, in Center City to, to, to fill back in is because of that Chinese wall structure. So again, if I look down from JFK, I'm, I'm where the old Chinese wall was and it was a barrier. And this area was a scary part of town. In fact, this part of Market Street, if you wanted to see a triple X movie, this is where you came. There, there were several, uh, you know, nasty theaters and bookstores, adult bookstore kind of things. Notoriously also and sadly, at the corner of, um, I believe that's 22nd in Market over there. Um, might be 21st. Um, you, you, it, it's where there was a Salvation Army uh, thrift store, and several several years back, the uh, a wall from a from a uh, a structure that was owned by one of the um, old uh, real estate owners that had a lot of dilapidated buildings tragically fell on the on the thrift store and several people lost their lives real sad avoidable story so here i am in the middle of the city and again even if there even if people were allowed to be out and not have to wear masks you would not find many more people at this time. It's just, there's just nothing here to draw you. And so, you know, when that decision was made, hey, we can turn an old rail structure that's, that's an eyesore and a problem into a solution, did the thinking go far enough? I mean, where's the access to the, to the rest of Philadelphia from up here? I'd have to jump down. That wouldn't be a good thing.
So here's an example of an area that really could still use more design thinking. Everything you're looking at probably looks really uh, bright. And that's because they replaced the concrete and the street, the, the asphalt. They put that fence that, that made us have to uh, technically trespass a little bit over there. So they did some quote improvements, but it didn't bring any life back. So I'm looking at a Trader Joe's Let me share with you some, some design thinking that I've had ever since I started passing by this area years ago. This Trader Joe's, at least at one point, I think it was the busiest Trader Joe's of any Trader Joe's in the country. And whether it still ha has that esteem or not, this is a really busy Trader Joe's. And can you imagine, I mean, take a look at the landscape right here. It would not at all cost that much money to go above the Trader Joe's sign do what's called a cantilever. Basically, you know, take a, uh, like basically extend that flat roof that's one story up. You could connect it all the way over to where we're standing. So you could provide access from where we are over to Trader Joe's. You wouldn't lose a single parking spot in this parking lot because you could, you could cantilever just right over it. And then you could have on, on, that, on that flat area, you could go into Trader Joe's, you could buy a corned beef sandwich, or you could buy a salad, and you could sit out on this newly created real estate that could be greened up, and gives you like a, an easy, accessible connection, you know, from a building that's technically on Market Street over to this JFK Boulevard. You know, why, why won't that be done? You know, I've had that idea ever since I've come here, you know, 10 years ago maybe, and um, you know, right, right now, as you see people social distancing, waiting in line to get their okay to go in and shop, um, you know, to this day, like that, that would be an amazing improvement. You mean to tell me that people wouldn't gather here with their drinks, with their sandwiches and stuff, if you didn't have like a green flat structure um, right connected to a Trader Joe's? The Murano building here, I think it's pretty cool architecture myself. That was a pioneer building when it was built as a condo on West Market Street. They had to do at least two or three absolute auctions, and I still don't know if it's all owner-occupied or not, but, but people did not want to live on this part of Market Street when it was built. All of that, or, if, or most of that, you can attribute um, in some way to the fact that the, uh, the, the Chinese wall was an impediment to this area and so it, this area was the last again to kind of like get life re reignited. So what else was created when they knocked down the Chinese wall? Well, that's what we're coming to. The area that's known as Penn Center was the, a direct replacement for the Chinese wall. So once they knocked down that rail structure, created a new street, it provided a good opportunity to add more buildings to Center City, Philadelphia. So we're, on, we're, we're at the newest western end of Penn Center. We're walking our way east to where it all kind of began in the late 50s, early 1960s, when they, when they built the first um, two Penn Center buildings, which are two Penn Center and three Penn Center. And now you have, you know, offices, office buildings with the address of like 11 Penn Center, 12 Penn Center, because that's how many buildings were built in, in, in replacement of the old uh, structure that was here. So you may have heard of Kevin Bacon, the actor. But Kevin Bacon's father was Ed Bacon. He was a city planner for Philadelphia from at least around 1950 to 1970. So if you're, if you're an urban planner, you're thinking design decisions and planning decisions all day long. And he was one of the people who represented the city of Philadelphia, who was one of the uh, key decision makers in the rebirth of this area 
once the um, you know once the uh, old structure called the Chinese Wall was removed, and then Penn Center came about in its replacement. We'll see a few examples of some of what his grand vision was around this, and how some of those some of those examples um, turned out the way he was hoping, but a lot of them didn't. He had very very grand hopes that Penn Center was going to be this bustling, you know, area that, that that brought that kept people in Philadelphia past five o'clock on the, on a weekday, and it never quite panned out that way. So we're looking at the Kennedy House and the Penn Center House, which were two, I believe they might have been the first two um, residential structures, um, or they were you know, among the first couple of residential structures that went up. So total 1960s looking architecture, late 50s, 60s architecture. So they were, they were built on this new street called JFK Boulevard as part of the uh, the, the renaissance that took place you know in this new area you can tell also by the design and cities how wealthy those cities were at different times if you go to chicago and new york city and you go into the office buildings especially those that were you know built in the 20s 30s and then even even well after the depression you see richness you see a lot of ornate use of marble and, and, and bronze and things like that. Philadelphia didn't really do so well after World War II. And, and a lot of that can even be reflected in the, uh, in the architecture. Kind of basic. So as you think about what you, you know, how, how does the design work for you on, on, the, on the section of JFK Boulevard we just walked, let's take a right on 19th Street and check some cool stuff out. So, I'm at what's called Commerce Street. Commerce Street, looking west, looks like one of those typical, wider than an alley, but, but narrower than a regular street, streets that Philadelphia has. You know, running between the more major streets, and right now it's kind of like equidistant between JFK Boulevard and Market Street. But let's look at what Commerce Street does over here. Look at that. Kind of see a tunnel there. And stuff built on top of it. So that is a conscious design decision that was made. And a little later on our walk, we're gonna see why that was. Just so you know, that's that's still on city maps. It's 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 an active city street. It just happens to go underground. So let's walk away from JFK for a bit. It's an opportunity to, to see what the rest of the city is doing in the midst of a pandemic. Here we are coming to 19th and Market Street. So we're in, in the, the heart of Philadelphia's financial district. We've got all kinds of financial service firms, stock trading firms, law firms are all gathered in this area. This is what Market Street looks like, again, on the during a pandemic 
not at all typical. This low slung building that we're coming to used to house the Philadelphia Stock Exchange. So all our maneuvering has been basically in straight lines. If you've ever been to the old historic part of Boston, they call it the hub, you could get lost there pretty easily. The streets are kind of curvy. They probably followed the, the contours of the land, so they're not in a grid. If you go to a newer part of Boston called Back Bay, it's set up like Philadelphia, it's on a grid. Similarly, if you go to Manhattan, Southern Manhattan, which is where New York was first settled, you could get lost around Wall Street. It is not at all grid-like. There's, you know, again, like one street runs into another and it's, and if you don't know your way around there, you get lost for a few minutes until you check your, uh, your little map of the city. So a grid is a very logical way to design a city. From an environmental standpoint, it has huge costs because of what has to be ripped apart in order to make that happen. But, but it is a conscious decision because you can, to this day, go to many cities that are not at, that not at all built on a grid like Philadelphia is. You can get a, get a sense of uh, why there's been noticeably less pollutants and smog in the air these days while there's cars around me. Again, mid-afternoon, this, this area, you'd be hearing honking, you'd see loads of taxis, buses, etc. Not so now. So I needed to make this detour. This is one of those sad stops that we need to make. See this curiosity that I'm looking at now? That's all that remains of the old Boyd movie theater. If you look up historic photos of the Boyd movie theater, it's like an art deco palace inside. Inside here, where they, where they sh showed motion pictures on a huge screen, it was, it was made in the Art Deco style. There was a huge mural in there that was gorgeous. There was a huge chandelier in the lobby area. Super, super ornate. I'm talking museum quality stuff. And a developer who took this over decided afterwards that he had a hardship and he could not make it work by saving the, in, the innards of the structure. And so all they basically have preserved is this not so um, ornate limestone facade, the, the black and the gray and the, and, the, and the blue and the red, that's just um, chintzy uh, stuff to, to, to make people think of the olden days in the 30s and 40s when this thing was a theater. At some point this will open and you'll go in here and you'll, you'll find your way into an expensive condo is what the plan is. But just like that, um, the loss of, of, of the uh, Penn Station in New York, when you look at the images of what the Boyd movie theater looked like inside, and you look at it, and if, you, if you've ever been to a concert at the Met, which is in, on North Broad Street, the Met is, was, was restored recently. It's an old opera house. Madonna just played there not too long ago. Why could they have not made the Boyd work in some capacity? Because they literally took a museum quality, historic building and they gutted it. That kind of stuff, I think is, is something that, that we, we then regret forever. Philadelphia used to be loaded with movie theaters. The CVS Pharmacy, you could see that curved facade over there. That was another movie theater.
So now, this is the, the rule on Chestnut Street. Can't get sushi today. Can't get Thai food today. If you wanna learn about an old entrepreneurial business that's been in Philadelphia for ages and ages and ages, there's Boyd's. Boyd's started out making expensive men's suits. It branched into, into women's clothing. So if you have money and you wanna get fitted, this is where you go. Who the heck would have thought that Boyd's would have black boards on it um, ever? So Boyd's is still a thriving family-owned business that's been part of Philadelphia for generations. And right now, it, just like everything else along these commercial streets, it's, it's closed. I mean, I am now walking in the middle of Chestnut Street on a Tuesday. When else can I do that? Another family business is Freeman's Auction House. You can see that they, uh, they moved. So take a look up high. We're looking at a monumental change of thinking and planning and design that took place in the late 1980s. So if you see a spire up there, that is one Liberty Place. The building that's mostly in view with the blue glass is, is two Liberty. And they were built by the uh, Rouse Company. And Willard Rouse was a visionary developer. And Philadelphia was in a situation right up into the 1980s where like the economy was pretty depressed. But in the 80s, there was a surge in activity and, and hence there was a surge in buildings. And Willard Rouse said, let's go tall. And if you've ever seen the this, this City Hall building, which is the, the, the seat of government in Philadelphia, William Penn sits on the top of that building. And there was something in place called the Gentleman's Agreement where even though it was not a law on the books, everyone who was, uh, any, any builder would always respect that. And all skyscrapers built in Philadelphia never went taller than William Penn's hat. And Willard Rouse, who I believe was from maybe uh, south of here, maybe Maryland, certainly wasn't a native Philadelphian, said, what's with that crazy rule? Um, wh why can't we go higher? Like, what, do you just wanna be a squat city for all your life. And so he said, I'm gonna build a building. There's no law against it. And I'm gonna go high. I'm gonna build the tallest building in Philadelphia. And Ed Bacon at that time, he had long since stepped down from his post of city planner, but Ed Bacon loved Philadelphia. And he was, uh, and whether, whether you agreed with his thinking or you did not agree with his thinking, he lived and breathed Philadelphia, and he thought it was sacrilegious to go above William Penn's hat. And he did all he could to fight it. He obviously did not win. Willard Rouse built One Liberty Place. And if you ever come down to Philadelphia now, or if you just even look from our campus at Center City, you could tell that One Liberty is not even the tallest building anymore. So in the late, eight, late 1980s, all these other buildings followed suit and Philadelphia, the, the skyline of Philadelphia was changed forever after Willard Rouse became the guy that said, I'm not gonna respect that old gentleman's agreement. Big, huge design decision that really changed the face of Philadelphia. There's impacts of design too, you know. Right now, I think we have this overuse of blue glass and uh, you see all these buildings in both University City and Center City made of that material. We might think it's cool, but birds don't. 
It kills billions of birds a year. Birds cannot see that glass like we can. And so too many times they end up slamming into it, breaking their neck and, and, and that's it for them. And then you have people who are employed by the buildings that go around early in the morning and sweep up the, uh, the remains of birds. It's a real sad thing, but um, there are designs out for glass that birds can actually detect. But you know, what's taking us so long to get them out? You know, we're the entrepreneurs getting that stuff out there and assuming that it's out there, like where are the entrepreneurial developers who are willing to say, okay, I'll do away with the, with, with the old blue glass, you know, in, in, in the spirit of preserving the lives of birds. So one unfortunate thing that we're gonna not get a chance to see right now other than I can impose some images for you because of this pandemic is what I'm looking at right now. So from my standpoint, and hopefully yours, you see a pizza shop and you see a hot bagel shop. But there's actually something between it. So remember I mentioned that guy, John Collins, he's the one that designed the walkway along the Schuylkill that we walked a piece of. As you can see here, I'm at John F. Collins Park. This beautiful gate is supposed to symbolize the, the, the Wissahickon Creek. There's another gate that we can walk around and see, and I believe that's supposed to symbolize the estuary of Philadelphia, like Philadelphia Estuary. Now, get a load of this from a design thinking standpoint. There used to be a building here, right? It could have been a pharmacy, it could have been a pizza shop. The building might have burnt down or it was not in use. And so the idea of a little pocket park, you know, in the middle of the city was pretty revolutionary. And I'm looking at the purple flowers of Eastern Redbud is in bloom right now. That's very cool. And so if we could go in here, we would actually find a water feature. We would find um, stones that are the bedrock of Philadelphia called Wissahickon Schist, at, like mixed in with the pavement. You could see all the seating in here. And so to me, this is a forward thinking design idea. You know, why do you have to infill every single slot with a building? If you can hear amidst the uh, limited traffic we have, you're hearing something that you don't normally hear in Center City, birds. So there's a tiny little bit of habitat in here. For your reference, we're right near 17th and Chestnut. I highly recommend, if you haven't seen John Collins Park, that once restrictions are lifted, that you check it out. It's a hidden wonder. So here's a couple other things that designers like to do sometimes. Do you want to be revolutionary or do you want to not? So, Anyone who's from New York and knows the Chrysler building might think, hey, Willard Rouse and his architect Helmut Jan, they seem to snag one from New York. You know, why does that look so much like the Chrysler building? So clearly a new 1980s design, highly influenced by an early 1930s design. Just detouring you over here for a second to see another kind of uh, building influenced by another, Let's go check out what used to be the radio station, WCAU. Now it's a closed old Navy store at its base. And then the Art Institute of Philadelphia, I believe has the upper floors. But this funky looking ornate building, let's check that out. See the top there? You know what influenced that? When the Empire State Building went up in around 1930 or 31, lots of other buildings kind of followed, um, followed its example. So again, this was a, a cool, funky building that went up in the 1930s in Philly. Um, 
but it, you know, it, it wasn't a brand new design. It was definitely inspired by designs that already were, were in, in vogue in places like, you know, like New York. So we now have a sense of what a city feels like built to accommodate several hundred thousand people at a time. And it also gives us a, uh, a feeling of what happens when something is that you don't normally think about, you know, something that you need to, you would need an electron microscope to see that originated in, in a different country in Asia. And because of that miracle of, of, uh, of contagion, you know, here we are walking around and we have the whole city to ourselves and yet it doesn't feel so good having the whole city to ourselves. This not too inviting looking alleyway just uh, will give us access to the other side of uh, Collins Park. You can see a uh, little turtle made out of um, iron here. And uh, on this iron gate, um, which represents the, the estuary of Philadelphia. And now we have a closer view of, believe it or not, what's a fountain, um, which normally would have um, you know, beautiful water uh, flowing down those, those vertical um, columns of concrete but unfortunately, we can't go in there and enjoy it. If you're, uh, if my GoPro lets you see it, you can see John Collins on that sign. Significant projects in Center City. Market Street East is one of them. We will not get there. You can see next, Schuylkill River, River Park. We were just there. Another park called Three Bears Park. And then if you've ever been down to the Society Hill area of Philadelphia, which is rather green for a city area, the Society Hill greenways were the result of his design thinking. So it's a good time to walk ourselves back to the Penn Center area. We'll get, we'll get ourselves closer to the old original or early days of Penn Center. And what, learn about the design intent of people like Ed Bacon and the other planners, architects, and developers that, uh, that were the early designers of the, of the buildings that first went up here. Here's Liberty Place looking up. If it's feeling surreal to you, that's exactly how it's feeling to me. It's a good thing I don't wear suits because I couldn't go buy a suit at Joseph A. Bank over there if I wanted to. Doors are locked. So now we're gonna head to the north side of Market Street. By the way, we just crossed over the Market Frankfurt subway. Okay, another design decision. Used to be elevated, then at a certain time, they decided, hey, better to put the sub, you know, make the elevated train a subway train. Again, frees up real estate. Let's the trains run underground and uh, lets people like us kind of enjoy the, uh, the street level at the same time. So we're coming to an opening. You should see a silver eight with a black background, and that stands for eight Penn Center. So I'm in the back of what's called eight Penn Center.
typically, like every other building in the city right now, empty. So this is really important to note and to think back to Edmund Bacon's days. So yes, it's dead now, and yes, there's a virus keeping everybody inside. But guess what? If this were a typical day, no pandemic in the atmosphere, this would be just about as dead as it is right now. So when Penn Center was built, Ed Bacon saw it as this golden opportunity to like, to put new happenings on the west side of City Hall, by the way, when we're, we talked earlier about City Hall, there's William Penn, his back is to us. Um, they put him facing north, his face mostly in the shadow. If you ever want to see a really cool thing when the pandemic is lifted, go, go do a tour. You can take an elevator that holds no more than about five and you can get to his base and see one of the best views of the city ever. So Bacon wanted to go across the street from William Penn and he was picturing this area thriving. He was picturing this whole area around us as nothing but like outdoor bars and restaurants and markets, farmer market kind of setups, thriving with life. Like the Faneuil Hall marketplace in Boston kind of, a, kind of life. And so it never happened. What do you notice that's really unusual about this area? pop quiz number two on this little trip. Where do these buildings get their deliveries? Okay, so this is Four Penn Center I'm looking at. There's JFK Boulevard is the street um, between Four Penn Center and Eight Penn Center. By the way, we're looking at old Pennsylvania Railroad's building that's now called One Penn Center. If you can remember all these Penn Center buildings. But if I went down to 16th Street, which is the next street over there, I'm telling you, there's no, there's, there's no street level delivery for Four Penn Center. I know from where I'm standing, this is Five Penn Center. Same goes for that. Same goes for this, which is probably, I'm guessing, Nine Penn Center, but I don't know that for sure. But all these buildings surrounding me, all with architecture that's kind of that basic modern stuff that came up in the 60s and then 70s. There's no place that's, that's gonna bother us if we wanna, you know, sit down, have a drink. There's no fumes from, uh, from trucks that we're ever gonna have here. You know, why is that? Well, that's what, that's what Ed Bacon was going for. He was going for verticality. Something that's a real small ode to bacon are these cloudy looking things over here, which who knows if I'm even gonna be able to see down, it's probably just gonna have a mirror effect, which in fact it does. Well, these let light down to what's called the concourse, a lower level, which as long as that's open, we're gonna go check out. So, so bacon saw the opportunity with an old rail set up here to, you know, why not put some life down below? And then let's also, while doing that, um, let's try to maximize the experience at street level. And then you have your high level office buildings, um, you know, housing the uh, wealthier companies of the city. But let me tell you that ever since these buildings were built, you've never had successful outdoor use of any of this. Great design intent, but the solution never, never occurred as planned. So one of our first impediments that we're gonna run into, just to show you, is I wanted to get down and show you the concourse. I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to do that, but I can't do it over here because this is closed today. So like all good entrepreneurs, we'll just simply improvise and see if we can get in another way.
see what I mean? There's the buildings over here. No loading docks anywhere. All four sides of, of, of every building in Penn Center, no need for, for loading docks. Okay, we're shut out by entrance um, number two. I will trust them and head over to 17th and JFK because I really wanted to show you this. Um, but sometimes the uh, Sometimes design is temporary. And is this the best use of, of informing people that a train station that should be open below us, um, you just can't even, it's public access, but you can't, you can't get into it. So we're gonna talk about what we're passing by right now. Hopefully we're gonna talk about it from a level below. So this beautiful limestone facaded building across the street is called One Penn Center at Suburban Station, former office building of the Pennsylvania Railroad that fronted right on the old Chinese wall um, that was here at the time that this was built in the early 1930s. So you can, it's kind of a uh, modest art deco structure, not as ornate as some others, and then you can see the uh, two Comcast towers um, and the second Comcast tower is now the current tallest building, taller than One Liberty Place um, in the city. So let's go see if we can find another entry to what's called the concourse so we can get below ground, answer some of those questions that we sort of posed earlier on, like what, where did that street lead to? What was Edmund Bacon thinking? And what do they do to get packages and furniture and things like that into uh, office buildings that are in the Penn Center complex? So this is a walkway down from the heyday of the 30s. You can see beautiful steel um, rails here that were used back when the railroads had money. Pennsylvania Railroad was, was a real rich railroad company. Uh, I'm going right past there, okay. So we're down below in what's called the concourse, and you can see that Philadelphia has a rich array of train lines, some above ground, some below ground. But we're right now in the uh, old Penn Center complex. I'm sorry, the old, the, the concourse where the old suburban station area is to my left, and we're gonna come to the newer area pretty soon, assuming it's even open. So the idea down here was that you could have commerce below ground, more commerce at street level, and then buildings above that. So you can tell there's a Dunkin' Donuts, everything is all closed down here. But just like the above ground area of Penn Center, this area doesn't get nearly the amount of usage that Ed Bacon and others hoped it would. You can see a sign here that says for Penn Center, 
This is how you can get up to Fort Penn Center. You could take a tr commuter train in, never see the light of day. You can see here, there's a sign that indicates the five Penn Center. So we're below all those buildings. Very spooky down here because there's zero activity. So let's take a look in here. Make believe we don't see that little sign up ahead. And check this out for a second. Not a place to take your first date, maybe? Well, I guess it depends. For me, back in my dating days, this would be a great first date, but I'm weird like that. So, hoping that we don't get kicked out of here. Guess where we are? You guessed it. This is Commerce Street. So when I showed you that tunnel, Earlier in the walk, you saw it went down below ground and it continues. You can see where, where it's lit. That's all part of the street, a public street called Commerce Street. And it's very quiet in here right now, but if you look all around us, you can see in the distance, no parking loading zone. This is where the trucks come in and deliver deliveries to the buildings of Penn Center. Kind of an ingenious design idea. Right? They get rid of a structure called the Chinese wall, a big rail structure above the ground. But they also thought in terms of what's the opportunity given that we have, we can use below ground to service these new buildings. And so Commerce Street was then submerged and to this day operates as the street that enables deliveries to come in. So it's kind of skeevy down here but that is why you don't have loading docks or any of that impediment up at street level, giving you the opportunity to have access on street access and p pedestrian access on all four sides of the skyscraper buildings that are sitting atop us right now. So here's an area to see another example of, Will, of, um, of Edmund Bacon's vision that happened to an extent but never happened the way he was hoping it would. So I'm looking out on a rather bland looking garden, but I'm below ground at the concourse level, but I, yet I can look up and I can see William Penn. So Ed Bacon's idea for this whole thing was can you let light come down to the subway level? And that's, and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted the office buildings to have that. And when we looked at that little skylit area that I only saw in a mirror format earlier, that was part of it. So his vision got, got realized in tiny, tiny little pieces, but not nearly to the extent that he, that he wanted. And again, it's extra eerie down here. If Ed Bacon was still alive, he'd be freaked out by this, just as a lot of us are. I can't walk up these stairs to get out right now because everything's shut for the pandemic. But even on a busy day, um, not much usage takes place. So here is an, another gathering area that was tried to, that the city tried to spruce up several years ago and like how do you get into it like there's it's just um it's just it this never gets use again b b before the before the virus situation this would get highly underutilized for what it is here you see herba market cafe And here's a sense, when we go back up to street level, this is Broad Street Station. 
and behind it was the end of the Chinese wall. So that's what it looked like in the heyday when there was this huge Pennsylvania Railroad station, this color postcard um, repro shows you the station and to the very right on the postcard, that's what's called the head house. So that was the largest of its kind in the world. Here's another view of it. So think about that, the trains going in and out there, that was, um, that was basically the terminus of the Chinese wall. Here's another example of trains coming in. It looks like they're coming right into where, where uh, City Hall is. So again, all of that was here before and Penn Center is what replaced that whole entire structure. And this is showing when the train shed went, underwent a uh, like a horrific fire. So where we are right now is at the meeting place of where you can get commuter trains. We can walk a f not too many yards and get to the Broad Street subway, which runs north-south underneath Broad Street. And we can also access the Market Frankfurt line, um, which is the east-west train that runs underground. So talk about ghost town. This sometimes feels like a ghost town even when it's open. But right now it's as eerie as can be. Hope they're watering their plants. They look pretty good, but I guess they're allowed to, oh yeah, there's cut flowers in there. Wonder who's buying them. We, get, we have access out this way? Thank you. No so if you breathe in and you were with me, you would smell human urine. So even though there's not a lot of activity around here, it's clear that, that people who are living on the streets are making their way down here. Might have to sneak our way out of here to show you where the, the, how, how well designed all this is as far as the transportation standpoint goes. This is the, uh, now we're crossing the Market Frankfurt line. So we won't have to sneak out. We'll uh, finally found ourselves a true legal exit. Here's the famous clothespin statue that we're gonna walk up alongside.
So as I cross back over Market Street to connect up where we just were underground, we're at the first two Penn Center buildings that were built. Two and three Penn Center, really, really plain architecture. But they were the first structures to go up in, in several decades after World War II. So if you check this sign out here, this is all that kind of remains to commemorate. So read that for a second. So we're standing on the site of where that old, beautiful Victorian structure called Broad Street Station was located. So right at the same time that the Penn Center project was being constructed, you had the original construction of what was called JFK Park, which now is known as Love Park. According to the sign, John F. Kennedy Plaza, So we're gonna make this the final stop on our entrepreneurial design thinking walk of Center City. So for our last stop, I wanted to bring you to Love Park, tell you a little story. It involves entrepreneurship, it involves sadness, and it totally involves design thinking. Before I do that, I want you to check out here, fittingly, located over here that, that pays tribute to Ed Bacon. And he'll fit into the story that I tell you in a second. Um, let's walk over to the, to the love statue or the, the love sculpture by Robert Indiana itself. Once upon a time, there was the first love park, and according to this sign, 1967 is when it was dedicated. And then a bunch of years later, there was the new love park. So I want to explain the story of how love park lost its love. And it starts out in the 60s, when this park was designed as a very modernistic design Ed Bacon was city planner at the time. We already talked that um, right over in, in, in the direction in which I'm pointing, that's all of the new part of Penn Center. And a parking lot sits underneath the where we this park. And on top, they build a, 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 a park, at that time called JFK Park. It was only a few years after JFK was assassinated. Day one, the park wasn't that successful in terms of use by people. So Love Park kind of sat pretty empty, but for homeless people using it, it was just like it got trashed. It, it, it wasn't, it just wasn't viewed as a place where people wanted to be. So then in the 80s, early 90s, guess who comes along with a, with a redesigned thinking um, to, to their way of being? If you look at old images of Love Park prior to 2018, you'd find that this park had a lot of levels to it. It was mostly all granite, and it had a lot of hard edges. 
It had a lot of layer, levels and layers and tiers and steps. So if you're a skateboarder and you see an empty park made out of granite and there's all these layers like that and levels with a huge geyser-like fountain at the center, you might think, hey, this is heaven for me. And so that's really what happened. So in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, skateboarders redesigned as citizens Love Park and turned it into something that got all kinds of um, usage, it got all kinds of attention. And so you had people from all over coming here, um, modifying the park in places and doing all kinds of artistic or art of artistry on their skateboards. Someone that I'd like you to look up after this, this uh, video that I'm shooting is over is Stevie Williams. Some catchwords to, to put into, you know, looking up for old YouTube videos or if you're gonna Google him, are Stevie Williams Love Park, Stevie Williams DGK, and we'll talk about that. Stevie Williams was about 15 years old. He's from North Philly at the time. Um, he had an alcoholic mother. Uh, his, I'm not sure if he knew who his father was, but I don't think he was present. Stevie Williams found himself on a skateboard along with several others that, that, would, uh, that, would, that would gather here in Love Park. And again, if you find this old footage, you'll be shocked at, uh, at, at, you know, at this sophisticated jumps and loops and things like that that, the, that uh, the skateboarders did at the time. And he was just you know, an artist at it. He got good at it, he got confidence, and then he, uh, he set out for California to try to become a professional skateboarder. So the story of, of, of Stevie Williams was that he goes out, and not only does he get successful becoming a skateboarder, um, he earns accolades, you know, for his art, but then he ends up forming a company, a branding company, um, selling things to the, to the skateboarding world. And, um, and what does he call this company initially? DGK. DGK stands for Dirty Ghetto Kid. And so dirty, Stevie, Stevie was called a Dirty Ghetto Kid and other such names. And he basically did a, like a, you know, basically a big F you to the world, named his company after the derogatory comments that he would hear while he was skating on a skateboard. And if you check him out today, he's a multimillionaire. He's a total entrepreneur. Um, his company expanded hugely and he's had all kinds of success. And he's not the only skateboarder who started out at Love Park. So, so you had all these cool stories happening. Think back to when you were watching our video in the midst of the, the street level of Penn Center. Dead as could be. Today, dead as could be in 1967 and dead as could be basically from, from then until the present. Philadelphia was becoming this place known for crazy skateboarding, right across the street basically from City Hall, which is I'm, I'm looking at at the moment. So you have all these artistic skateboarders skating around across the street from City Hall, a park that was underutilized, it becomes heavily utilized. And then the mayor of the, of the city says, that's not cool, that's not, it's uncouth to have this kind of thing so close to City Hall. That was his thought. <laughs> he makes the decision that skateboarders should not be allowed to use Love Park. At, also at the time, what you have going on is you have another company whose name escapes me, sees what's going on. ESPN had something called the X Games. X stands for Extreme Sports. And so you had all this attention being focused on Philadelphia and you had a company that said to Philadelphia, we will give you a million dollars in support of turning Love Park into really a skateboarding mecca. And so what does is, what is Mayor Street and his, his, his colleagues do? Well, they end up, long story short, turning down the million dollars, and then they end up making it illegal to skateboard in Love Park. The sign that I just stood near showed that Ed Bacon died in 2005. He was in his 90s. One or two years before he died, I believe, he had a couple people, um, including Greg Heller, who wrote a book about him, 
help him up to Love Park soon after Mayor Street he said no skateboarding and he basically practiced civil disobedience on the skateboard. Ed Bacon, a planner and designer at heart, realized the beauty of citizens redesigning a, a park that the, that the original design wasn't working for. And he thought it was terrible that the mayor would shut down skateboarding on this park. And so in civil disobedience, he actually skateboarded a few feet, um, helped by others to kind of show his displeasure. So if you look at Love Park today, look at it. It's very bland. The city spent over $20 million a few years ago to basically flatten it, make it more user-friendly. Um, they put a tiny fountain right now that's not on. It doesn't go nearly as high as the old fountain, which I'm telling you was probably the most powerful stream of water that you could find in the city. And Love Park gets used. Tons of people get their picture taken by the Love statue. But Phil and then what did Philadelphia do? They built Pain Park, which is a skateboarding, skateboarding park that they put all the way out the Ben Franklin Parkway, out of the way so they could get those skateboarders like out off of the beaten path. So the skateboarders have their place, but it's not where it used to be. But think about if Philadelphia took that million dollars. Think about if this whole thing became known as the artistic skateboarding center of our country. What would that have done to those vacant spaces around all the Penn Center buildings? Can you see it? 24 seven bars and restaurants coming up because skateboarding can, can take place 365 days a year. It can be in the broad daylight, it can be at night. It's, it's fun, it's as cool as ballet. And so the city shut that down. It was an excellent design and planning decision that was spurred by people. So when, when, you're, when you're thinking about design, just because somebody's a professional designer does not mean that your design is exceptional. And just because you don't think you have a degree in design does not mean that you're, you can't be a designer. And that's what I want to leave you with, you know, the power of design thinking. It's creative thinking, it's entrepreneurial thinking. Had that been done here in, in Love Park, this place could be thriving right now with or without the pandemic. So think about that. Again, check out who Stevie Williams is and look for the old footage of, of Love Park and other people skating in it and see what you think.